Welcome to the Mom and Dot 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 podcast. We're your hosts, Suzanne Kearns and Missy Stevens. We want to help you through everything that happens in the ellipses, from your professional life to your emotional health. You're a mom and so much more. Let's figure out what comes next together. Welcome to the Mom and Dot 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 podcast. I'm Suzanne Kearns, Mom and Dot 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 writer, LGBTQ and sex ed advocate, and today a Swedish Schroth stall bar installer. That is so hard to say. So yes, and uh, I will post pictures later. There is going to be definitely a level and a stud finder involved, and lots and lots of cursing, and probably at least 48 hours of my weekend. So <laughs> stay tuned. <laughs> you might be surprised and it might go so smoothly. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I'm Missy Stevens, mom and dot, 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 writer, foster child advocate. And this week, learning all about 2 million Texans, thanks to my friend, Suzanne, and how I can get involved in encouraging people to vote. Kind of exciting. Yay. And this week, we are super excited to be talking with Tammy Hackbarth. Tammy works with professional women who want to get their time and energy back so they can go after big life goals. Tammy began her career working in politics after graduating from UC Davis. In her mid-30s, she began her second career as an elementary school teacher. It was in her work as a teacher that she found herself physically, mentally, and emotionally exhausted. I can only imagine. Yes. These were the beginning signs of burnout. In response, Tammy began practicing 100% guilt-free self-care. It completely changed her life. She now dedicates her career to helping women change their lives through 100% guilt-free self-care. She's a certified life work coach through UC Davis Extension and coaches professional women privately all over the country. Welcome. She, she also has the best bangs in the history yes. of bangs. Yes. <laughs> yes. Enviable <laughs> bangs that she is getting recut this week. That's right. I, I'm currently... Well, I got a lot of bang right now. We're going <laughs> to rework the bang stitch uh, soon. Yeah. We're, we, these are summer bangs, and then we're going for fall bangs, which are bangs um, that can actually touch your forehead because uh, it's so hot. <laughs> right. Yeah. Now actually is not a great time to have hair over your forehead. Oh, that's true. But no, as we said before we got on, I if she had her full bang going, I don't even know if I could concentrate. I'd have to turn off the video because I'm in such bang envy that bang it's, just, envy. it's just not even normal. But yes. And the reason I know up and close and personal uh, how adorable your bangs are is because we met at like so many of our guests at Mom 2.0. And in fact, we joked last week that my dog got into my Mom 2 pile and ate a bunch of stuff. And one of them was your business card. I'm very sorry. <laughs> I still have it. I know. Well, I kind of have it. It's like, rah, rah, rah. but yeah, so we listed a little bit about you in your bio, but for people who haven't had the pleasure of meeting you, can you give our listeners a little Tammy 101 about where your career started, how it's progressed and anything that impacted your choices along the way? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm Tammy Hackbart and currently I am a life and work coach. I host a podcast. I am a in progress author is that how you say when you're writing a book i'm like you can't quite claim it till it's finished but i'm it's on its way nice. i'm a keynote speaker oh. i studied political science in college and i'm one of those weirdos that actually took my degree and went out and worked in the field and i was in politics for 10 years my first paid job was in the speaker's office in the california assembly i've ever had a lot of jobs y'all but my last job in politics, I was a lobbyist where I worked on issues like physician aid in dying and methadone replacement and adoption. And so I was doing work that was really, really close to my heart for about a decade. But what went with that was this constant state of, oh my God, I think I'm dying. I'm in the wrong profession. And I moved jobs around a lot because I thought, it's got to be the job. It can't be me. Right. It can't be this like mismatch. And I was like, other people seem to be able to do this. And it could be you guys. I was like, I think there's something wrong with me. And during this time, my husband had been a traveling musician, but he also studied to be an elementary school teacher. And when I saw him really get down into teaching, I was like, dude, he's doing fundamentally what I want to do, which was with the whole reason I went into politics was I wanted to make the world a better place. 
And when I found out I'm not a macro person, I'm a micro person, I have the skills to lobby. Gives me a tummy ache. <laughs> right. So that so that's what so making the world a better place was fundamentally why I went into politics. And yes, I was talking to people and yes, we were making laws and yes, we were changing things and yes, and yes, and yes. But I, it was a long process of compromise mm -hmm. and it turns out I'm more of a quick process before and after, and I don't actually want to compromise on things that I fundamentally believe in. So I pivoted <laughs> to become a teacher and what I did I as a that. teacher, and so that, that loses people. They're like, how do you go from working in politics where you're wearing a suit and you're testifying in front of committees and you're helping write bills and you're doing all this stuff to then walking people to and from a classroom and teaching them how to read and write? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and I say working with grownups and working with kids is very similar but when I was working with kids, I could say things. If somebody was being, say, wildly annoying, as kids are, I worked with third and fourth graders. And when somebody's poking someone, I could say to that person, hey, kiddo, zero people like that. No <laughs> one likes that. So now you know. Now you can make better decisions. And they're like, okay. Did it work every time? No. But it, I was an activist teacher in that I really tried to instill this notion that what they do every day in their own lives and in their school community, in their classroom mattered. So if they had a problem, I wasn't the arbiter. I was not the judge and jury. Like we would come together and be like, so let's say something happened at recess and then we're coming back in for learning time. Let's be real. I don't want to hear that shit anyway, because it did not happen on their watch, <laughs> but you are more than welcome to go in the back and write it down on the agenda. And then on Friday, we're going to get together. We're going to look at all the agenda items and I'm going to read the agenda items and ask you, is this still relevant? So you get to have your tattle fest in a notebook. We get to really cull down what are the real problems. And the purpose of this was not to get anyone in trouble. It was to help them get along with each other better. I really like to apply that to like my grown up life that I should. If I wrote it down, I should give it a few days and then see, does it still scare me or do I still need to do it? Or am I still worried about it or whatever it is? Like give yes. it a beat. Exactly. Well, and then you can apply the five rule, which is it does this matter in five seconds, five minutes, five hours, five days, five weeks, five years. And you don't give all your attention to the five minute problems. You call in all your resources for the five-year problems. Mm -hmm. Sometimes for the five-month problems, depending on what it is. Right. But then, but it gives everybody that, that time and space to be like, okay, is this still a problem? Or was I mad and trying to get that kid in trouble again because he's annoying? It's like, look, he may be annoying, but he has to live with himself 24 hours a day. You only sit by him for six. <laughs> so is it still a problem for you? Or can we help him be less annoyed because mm -hmm. we all have to get along here for 180 days. Yeah. Um, and then you may think, well, why did you change your career if you loved being a teacher? Two reasons. It turns out grownups kind of ruin everything, you guys. <laughs> so that was reason number one. But the real reason is I became a mom. <laughs> oh, that'll do it. And then mm -hmm. I became a mom and my kid is fancy. She came already pre-baked. She's, we became parents through international adoption. Oh, so yeah. we didn't get a little bitty baby. We got a bigger baby, but a bigger baby that had like bigger needs. Like, mm -hmm. hi, it's nice to meet you. We can actually shake your hand because you're on the outside. Mm -hmm. Who are you? So he spent a couple of years really leaning into the bonding process. So I was on break with a full intention of going back to teaching. And then I ended up not going back to teaching because I started a business instead. And that business was teaching yoga when, and I would just like to just tell everyone who's teaching yoga, nobody cares where your feet go in a posture, but they really want to know is how do I feel better in my life? 
Like mm-hmm. every one of my private clients, because I was like, public classes, I'm a huge introvert. I can't deal with this like general public. So I had these private small sessions and people never came to me and were like, tell me where my ankle goes. Tell me where I'm should put my hand. They were like, how can I have the time and energy at the end of my work day, even with work that I love? How do I have time and energy for my life after work? And I was like, that is an excellent question. We should figure out together. Because that's one of the things I had to do as a teacher, right? I had to figure out how do I, at the end of the school day, not like crawl on all fours to the car Mm -hmm. and sort of melt into the car. So it's what I did for a few years, right? Because teachers, especially female teachers, are asked to be these really selfless martyrs of give it all, don't leave anything for anyone else. But that's not sustainable. No. Not at all, right? And so fundamentally what people come to me for then and now is, but how do I have the time and the energy and the bandwidth to create this meaningful life that I want to live? I think when we set this up, we joked back and forth on email. Let's just talk about how not to feel like shit, which I think (laughs) is the summary of what you do is you help people not feel that way. But I really want to spend a few minutes talking about, and you've touched on it a little bit already, but why do we feel that way? Why have we gotten to this place where we can't even figure out where to start to make ourselves feel better? Okay. So I've thought a lot about this because this that thing, it's like asking fish about water. They're like, what the fuck are you talking about? (laughs) Duh, it's right here. You live in it. Suzanne, you're going to want to stop drinking for a second. (laughs) Uh Uh-oh, am I going to do a spit take? (laughs) Maybe, because this is what I was like. Ooh, what should I say? And I was like, just fuck it. Just say it's a patriarchy, guys. It's the patriarchy. Mm. Our systems of how our world is set up is not set up for people to even survive, let alone thrive. And I don't know if you know this, but as women, we're not at the top of the pecking order in how our system is set up. Nope. So the long and short of it is it's a systematic problem and... We need to do personal things so that we have the bandwidth so that we can change systems. Mm, yeah. It is that weird chicken egg thing. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, I don't have the bandwidth to do the thing that I need to yes. do, but I can't do the thing without the bandwidth. Mm-hmm. Right. And part of patriarchy, honestly, is it's patriarchy and biology. We as humans have a fundamental need for each other. As our friend Brene Brown, hi Brene, says we're wired for connection, right? We're hardwired for connection, right? You don't want to be the part of the pack that's such a jerk that gets left out to be food on the savannah, right? Mm -hmm. You want to be in the inside of the pack. So you have to be likable enough to be part of a group. So I think fundamentally we're like, I need to be likable to everyone for safety, which is the same reason why we have so much trouble as white women saying, fuck, white supremacy benefits me. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't see it because I see all the ways, I see all of the obstacles in my way. But as white women, we're still a protected class. Yep, that's I was for like, sure. damn, this went downhill. Thought she was going to be funny. I was going to get some like, <laughs> real easy breezy things. I have those too, right? But the but the thing is, is like you're not crazy if you no. think shit. This is really hard. It absolutely is. Uh, my parents got divorced when I was in, it was in the seventies, so I was in like late elementary school, and I saw my mom not be able to write a check with her own name on it. I saw my Mm -hmm. mom not be able to uh, have a credit card in her own name. And so at a very young age, I was like, this is not fair. I have a really deep justice bone. Like, this is not fair. We need to change this. Mm -hmm. So I I grew up with a, a quietly super feminist mom. So what do you mean by quietly feminist? Like we would be up in the, the, the credit department at Mervyn's And my mom would be like, (sighs) explaining to me what the problem was. She's like, we're in the middle of divorce. The assets are locked right now. I'm like, your name's not even on the card. She's like, that's another thing. I'm like, what is this Mrs. My Dad's name? And she's like, that's how women are referred. I was like, you're not even your own person. Yeah. 
right? So the, this is my lifetime. This isn't like some mm-hmm. like back in the olden days. This is my lifetime. And then I had a shitty boyfriend uh, for a really long time. Like almost Everybody a has to have one of those at least. <laughs> oh my God. My, my, at one point I tried to bring him up in therapy and my therapist was like, can we just call this a rite of passage and save you a bunch of money? And I was like, for real? And she's like, and then she spent 10 minutes telling me about her shitty boyfriend. I was like, we're great. I was like, it's a rite of passage. Cool. But what I learned with that guy was like, it didn't matter how likable I tried to make myself. There was always going to be something he was nitpicky about. And I was like, fuck this. I'm going to turn myself up to 11. And if you don't like me, do you know who really does like me? Me and my girlfriends. Yes. Oh, well, it's interesting you say that because you're talking about him yeah. being all nitpicky. But I think so many of us don't even need the shitty boyfriend to be nitpicking. We'll do it to ourselves with this. Oh, say voice. We have that covered and negative oh. self-talk. And I love that you named yours Blanche. I think that's, that's adorable. So Missy's is kind of named Gritty for so far. I don't know if it's going to stick with that. And I need to name mine. But how do you address external people aside when yours is the voice that is saying that you haven't gotten to the place yet where you're saying, you know, who likes me is me. How, how do you address that with your clients? Okay, so here's some more chicken egg. Ready? <laughs> I how I how I get people to do it, do it is take care of themselves as if they love themselves, right? This is like you kind of treat yourself as if you're a separate entity. Hmm. Right? Much like you would not let a toddler get too hungry or too tired or too why? Because they're delicate like a bomb, not like a flower, right? <laughs> Who are we? When push comes to shove, we're tall toddlers that can drive. And mm-hmm. when our fundamental needs are met, we can kind of rule the world. Yeah. So what do we do? How do we get started? We start really small. And we don't have to be like, so if we're over here, Blanche is a shit talker. She is, <laughs> you guys, I'm writing a book right now. All guns are blazing up in this biz, mm. right? Oh, I bet. Right. So yeah. what we do Brody has is, a lot to say when I'm at my computer writing. Yeah. Right. So what we do is we're like, I see you, Gritty. I see you. Hey, you want to hang out with Blanche? Do you guys need a hug? <laughs> Can we hug it out? <laughs> we're going to hug it out. Okay. Um, and mostly what we do is we experiment. What would happen? And you can't quit the experiment mid experiment. What would happen if for the next 30 days, you fill in the blank one thing that you're like I don't have time for that let's start with sleep because everyone's like I'll sleep when I'm dead I'm like you're gonna die sooner if you don't sleep so what would happen if instead of taking your mom alone time while you're shoveling Pringles and like canned frosting and wine down your gullet I'm feeling attacked (laughs) <laughs> yeah what if instead of doing Nutella that, and Cheez-Its <laughs> I love yeah. Nutella and Cheez-Its <laughs> right like whatever p- pick your yumminess mm-hmm. what if instead of waiting up for that every kid to go to sleep your spouse to be in bed what if you just went to bed what if you went to bed before everybody else because you're like you know what I've been tired for 15 years I'm just gonna go to bed <laughs> for 30 days what if you got enough sleep or more towards your ideal sleep and see what else in your life changes. Be a scientist, take your notes. Because I, I mean, I could tell you, you're going to have more energy. You're going to have more willpower. You're going to be able to exercise. You're going to be able to pack your lunch. You're not going to scream at your kids. You're all of these things. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that from my experience and the experiences of my clients, but it's much like meditation. Do you guys know how many books I read about meditation before I started meditating? The answer is 14. <laughs> 14 fucking books. And you know what? I did not feel better until I sat down, shut up for three minutes, a lot of days in a row. And I was like, God. So this is experiential learning, right? Yes. You, there is not a lack of information that people no. have. We talk about that all the time. We have, we have access to everything we need to know and more (laughs) like (laughs) like an ocean full of information in addition to what we need right so what if rather than try to do everything 
we do one thing that we are like, this is insultingly stupid. This will never work. This will not change anything. And we just shut up, put our scientist hat on for 30 days and take notes. Y'all, mm. I just want to tell you two things. One, I have been keeping track of my sleep quality and quantity for 11 years every day. What? Because <laughs> both of our faces are like, <laughs> I know we're like, what? Because I wanted to know, especially when I had a little kid, why I was such a absolute bitch grenade sometimes and not others. Mm -hmm. Tired. And the correlation between the it, any alcohol in this body, <laughs> which messes with my sleep, which therefore is a lack of sleep. I was like, oh, so the difference between me being a human being that can deal with a toddler and not is sleep. I was like, are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. It is the foundation of my actual sanity. <laughs> and it's embarrassing. I'm like, that's it. Sorry. Like, I, I got nothing. I don't I think that's embarrassing at all. Nothing fucks with my sleep. Like, I start thinking about sleep as I'm getting up out of bed in the morning. I'm like... Because I've been a lifelong insomniac, yeah. like I have to full on date myself all day and do all the things so I know that I can be tired enough in my body, tired enough in my brain, mm -hmm. have enough space up there. I'm like, oh my God, in order to sleep, I have to exercise. In order to exercise, I have to do PT. In order to, but I'm a scientist of myself in that I'm like, you got the data that shows. You are in fact a bitch grenade when you don't. <laughs> so now, as the uh, as a data nerd, I I yeah. love this aspect of it. Like that's that's getting my attention. I think that I could work that angle to make it more exciting. When you are tracking your sleep, are you literally just like went to bed now? I got up at this time, and then I woke up three times during the night. Like how how are you measuring that? Um, I I wore Fitbit for years, mm -hmm. and then. Here's something else to know about me. I got tired of it bossing me around. And so I threw it away because I was like, fuck it. I got enough data. I'm an asshole and I'm asleep. Okay. I need to move my body. Got it. Um, mm -hmm. So what I do is I write down when I, when I think I fell asleep, when I woke up, if I woke up in the night and it was notable. Mm -hmm. And then I talk about things like why I woke up. Bad dream. It was too hot. It was too cold. Here's one for the people that the future is coming for you. It was heartburn. <laughs> because I ate potato chips that day after a certain time, right? Like more scientific data. I'm like, oh, every time I eat chips, I get that like, Ugh, in the middle of the night. God, okay. It's so fun, God. aging. I love it. <laughs> and, I mean, here's the thing. We get to be more refined scientists as we age, right? That's a good because, way to look at it. Can, can I eat chips? You betcha. Who's the only one that's going to pay for it if I do? This one. Yes. Unless mm -hmm. I don't sleep. And then I'm going to make sure everybody pays. Everyone's going to pay. <laughs> everyone's going to pay because I didn't sleep. Because the grenade's going to go off. So it's systems aren't set up for us. So there's not going to be a magical time or age or space where your job or your spouse or your kids or anything is going to come to be and be like, I think you need to take better care of yourself. So take these experiments. And, and I, I will offer this to everyone that's listening. What's the one thing that you're like, fuck that. I don't want to do that. It could be giving up your wine. It could be going to bed early. It could be moving your body. The thing that you resist the most, most likely is the thing that could make the biggest difference. For me, it's going to bed early. I know that. And I've actually, it's funny that you talk about it because this week. I have just been consistent about getting in bed. Now, I haven't had a great night's sleep every night, but I just don't think my body's trained for that yet. Mm -hmm. But I'm just being consistent and I'm setting the alarm for a consistent time and just getting my tired butt out okay. of bed. But Missy, are you setting an alarm to remind you to go to bed also? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Like yeah. I am I have being three very consistent. <laughs> oh, you do? So I have three go to bed alarms. I don't need an <laughs> alarm to wake up. I'm 52. Like I wake up the chickens so they can wake up everybody else. But like <laughs> um, I, cause you're, you start out the day with tons of uh, willpower and good attentions. Oh, yeah. And then depending on the age and temperament of your family, goes down real low, real fast. Mm -hmm. Perhaps sometimes mm -hmm. by the time you get them to school. So by bedtime, I'm like, where's the bourbon and American spirits every mm -hmm. night? 
Like, I, that's I what I want to do at night, too, person. is have a cocktail and watch a show and yep. zone out. And I, this week, it's just funny that we're talking about it now. Like, I have stopped that. It is hard. It's not Wait, a habit let, yet. Let me get, but let me guess. Your kids went back to school, didn't they? Yep. Because that damn structure, you're like, this teacher's going to be real mean to me at that tardy slip on the third day. <laughs> I'm going to make sure I get those kids there on time. And I'm going to make yeah, sure we get I up really early around here. Go, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Suzanne, are you also saying that you have a hard time going to bed? I. I do not have a hard time going to bed in the sense that I can just like lay down and I am asleep, <laughs> but I do have a hard time. Like that's considered my leisure time because our kids mm -hmm. hang out. The youngest usually heads up about 830. And so like around nine o'clock is when we're able to like hang out and watch a show together. Yeah. And you know, that if, if I want to go to bed on time, that means one show. And I'm like, oh, one show, that's lame. Like, how are we going to binge everything that Netflix and Hulu and Paramount Plus and HBO Max has <laughs> in just one hour? Um, so that, that is a problem. Mm -hmm. I don't know. That, but we are trying to get better. My husband's trying to get better because he's got a lot going on at work too. And so, you know, sleep is definitely, I think Missy, you mentioned this because we came to this realization, especially living in Texas, that we've got a lot of battles to fight here and we really need to be fully fueled in order to have the energy to fight all the fights that need to be done here. Yeah. So that is a big thing. So yeah, when we're talking about self-care, that's obviously one of the big things, sleep, sleep hygiene, sleep, sleep. But again, self-care is not like just putting, you know, lotions on and getting a massage. It's, it really is just the basic things that keep you alive <laughs> during the day, like getting water, getting sleep. What are some of the other things for self-care? Probably exercise also, like if we did three things, is that going to knock out like 90% of the self-care that would actually make us better, nicer human beings? <laughs> okay. You know what? I'll even take it. Yeah. I'll give you three things that you maybe haven't heard before. Stop talking shit about yourself. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Everyone's like, God, it's so <laughs> yeah. hard. Stop talking shit about other people. I God, do that. What? I do that. <laughs> um, and sleep. Okay. And here's why. So, so, so true self-care is all the stuff you don't want to do because it's hard. You don't want to tell your neighbors that their kid can't come over because you don't want them to think you're a bitch. But you're like, your kid riles my kid up and then it kind of ruins everything in my house, mm -hmm. right? So you don't want to be telling your mom, like, I hate when you blah, 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 because you're like, then I won't be able to talk shit about you with my friend um, if you have that hard conversation. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. self-care is, it's the unsexy shit that fuels your life. It's all yeah. the stuff your grandma told you to do. Eat vegetables, take a walk, wash your face, get a good night's sleep. But if you, if you can just stop talking shit about yourself and not let your friends talk shit about themselves in your presence, and here's how you stop that. You ready? Suzanne is going to say something negative about herself. You guys are going to laugh because it'll be funny. And then Missy's going to say, Hey, Suzanne, stop talking about my friend like that. And she's going to go, oh, quit it. And you're gonna both going to be like, oh, that's right. That's right. You're not garbage at blah, blah, blah. Right? And so how do you, how do you go from being a shit talker to not? As again, yeah. I call it the third player. You look at yourself and you're like, oh, you're having a really hard time. So one of the ways that I worked with my little itty bitty kid who's now in sixth grade, she's preteens our parenting you like you just went into a whole other division oh, of yeah but when when my kid was little and a kid would be like completely laid out in target like losing their ever-loving mind and the mom would be either paralyzed like i don't know what to do or she would be like trying to control this mayhem and we would stop and i would narrate to my child i was like that kid's having a really tough time right now I was like, and that mama's really worried about her kid. And she's worried that everybody's thinking that she's a bad mom. My kid's like, I do that. I'm like, I know. Mm -hmm. That's how I know how that mom feels. Right. And then I look at the mom. I'm like, it's okay. We're not judging you. They're having a hard time. But what, like what in, in your life would change if somebody, when you were having an actual hard time, which is why you're expressing 
all your things. If somebody said, wow, you're having a really hard time, not mm. in like, I need to change you or you're weak or you're something's wrong with you, but it's like, damn, we're in this moment together. It is hard. You might be like, yeah. I'm really hungry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so tired, or I'm really hot because I'll be like same girl same right and, and I, I think we're so solutions based that we tend to instead of just saying I acknowledge your hard time we're like you seem like you're having a hard time and here are 10 things I think that you should do right now and I think that we do that to ourselves too like I'm having a hard time so I need to fix everything Instead of like you're saying, focus on one thing. And you talk a little bit about on your podcast, actually talk a lot about it, about that perfectionism. Like you're having a hard time. There's 10 things that can fix it. Go do the 10 things. How do you help people break out of that perfectionism cycle? We've talked about it just last week on the podcast. I think like we mm -hmm. struggle. Um, so one of the things that I'm constantly modeling for people is like, you've never met a bigger perfectionist than me. Like I used to wear this badge so proudly, you guys. And then I learned what nobody wants to learn, which is this a defense against anybody being able to, I'm an Enneagram one, anybody being able to say that you are bad mm -hmm. or that you're not enough or that you're garbage. I was like, oh my God. And then I tried to change it and rationalize saying, but I just have high standards. No, you're just still an asshole. You need to chill, <laughs> right? And here's the thing, you, and you guys have kids. I know you haven't been a teacher, but what do kids do better than anything ever in the history of the world is they show you your shit in the most unattractive way yep. ever. There's nothing like hearing a four-year-old go, well, actually, and you're like, oh, who says, well, actually, oh, shit, that's me. <laughs> right? I have actually said, don't you well, actually me. <laughs> oh, well, actually me. <laughs> right? So for a long time, I was like, I said, apparently, so every kid in my class said, apparently. Oh my God. That's so funny. Oh my right? kid. So, yeah. I couldn't be a teacher. I would ruin those kids. But, yes. so, but that's the thing. So how do we get out of the perfectionist cycle is I have a, I write a morning mantra and on the days where I'm really struggling, I tell myself all day, let it not be perfect. It has to be very active. It has to be really bossy. It's not allow it not to, it's like, let it not be perfect. Let it not be perfect. I just boss myself around because rationally, I know that perfect doesn't exist. Right. But irrationally, I'm like, but if anyone's going to find it, it's going to be me. And then I have to be like, imperfect action. Done is better than perfect. Hell, done is better than not done because so many people aren't finishing anything. Because they're stuck in the perfectionism wheel. Yep. That's how I'm able to write. I'm like, it doesn't matter what I put out. Everyone's going to be impressed that I finished a book. <laughs> I'm going to think it's absolute shit. Everyone's going to be like, this is so good. I'll be like, whatever. Who'll do? Ha ha. And I finished. I finished. Oh. You're welcome. There's the inside of my head. Oh. <laughs> well, yeah. Speaking of that procrastination, I, I love your deferred maintenance. Yes. <laughs> the, the topic of it and the workshop that you have I'm on the, on list the topic. For the workshop. Yeah, because I I think our maintenance has been very very deferred. <laughs> okay, so the whole so, so my I have a group coaching program. It lasts a year. It was six weeks. I thought I could just bing 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 teach people what they need to know and send them on the way. And then people kept signing up for it, and it was like, are we still dancing? What are we doing here? Don't you know? And they're like, what we need is a community of people to be like, I'm struggling in this because this thing in my life changed. So mm -hmm. how, it, how now it works as a year long program is in January, we set goals that we actually want to do. That's another thing I want to tell everyone. Stop setting goals around shit you don't want to do. That is why it's so hard to get it done. Let's start with things you want to do. <laughs> like, not that you have to do it. Like yeah. once you start doing concept. stuff you want to do, right? But once you start doing stuff you want to do, you can like, Convince yourself that maybe someday you can get your will and trust finished, right? But I did it. It's there. up there. It's up there. <laughs> I know. Mine sounds here. It needs to be renewed. But I'm like, but maybe I want to swim 156 times this year. I know it's very specific. It's because I had this other goal, which was swim 30 minutes without stopping. But I was like, you can't just be throwing up a end goal up there as a goal. You got to make that shit a process. Or you're going to, on New Year's Day, you're going to be like, I didn't make it. Well, you didn't make a plan either. 
So we said all of January, like figuring out what we want and we dream big and we're like, well, that kind of scared me. And then the next month we talk about stop talking shit about yourself and others and all of those mindset practices that can get you into the flow. Then we focus on your physical body, eating like you love yourself, sleeping like you love yourself, scheduling yourself like you love yourself, which is not hurry, hurry, hurry. As the year progresses, then we talk about mental health, including uh, working with a professional mental health counselor on ACEs. If you guys don't know about ABS, I love to talk about ACEs. And so we, we normalize seeking out professional mental health, especially for things that we think, I've got those childhood traumas all tied up in a box in my head. They're there forever. But it turns out, as we know, the more we learn about ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, that that shit could potentially shorten your life. Absolutely. We talk about it a lot in foster care. That's a big thing. And every, everybody has something. It's very rare to meet someone with, that doesn't even have one ace. Like we, we all have something. We all have, see, you know what's crazy? I have a seven. Like, yeah. I like almost have a full deck. And people, I think, there's this misconception, like, I must have my shit together because I had this easy life. I'm like, no, friends. Actually, what happened is I had a really rough beginning and was like, fuck this. <laughs> I would like a different ending. And so while my ACEs is, is high, my personal resilience is also high. And resilience is built on those things that we're talking about in deferred maintenance is like taking care of your body, taking care of your mind, taking care of your relationship with others and yourself. And we sort of culminate in this, like, so now that we're resourced as a personal level, and now we're resourced as a family, and now we're resourced as a neighborhood, how can we be part of something bigger than ourselves to make the world a better place for everyone who's in it? And it's not mm -hmm. from this, like, judgy, I'm going to go in there and tinker around and make it better. It's like, no, I'm going to be holding your hand going, I know that it's counterintuitive that you being well-rested is going to change the world. Why not change it today? But it will change the life of yourself, your child, your family, your school community. And it goes outward from there. And I'm there to do the work that you aren't able to do because you're resting. Like we're building this community care system one person at a time. That's ultimately what my work is about is like, I want people to build their dream life, but really to create the world they want to live in. And I want a world that is equitable for everyone who's in it. We are very far from that. And some days I get really discouraged, like, oh, I'm not going to see this in my lifetime. I, it could, you could be fall into be helpless and hopeless. But there's so many people that we could look back in history and say, they did not see the end of their work after they've died. They were part of the, the mechanism that made changes possible. And I can be part of that change too. Mm -hmm. But you can't be part of the change if your needs are like popcorning out of your body, right? Like we have to resource ourselves, resource our families, our communities, so that we can be of service to the rest of the world. That's really where this whole idea of self-care is very political. It's not an accident that we're all tired, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So now I love the idea of all these kind of the stepping stones of this deferred maintenance program. So you started it in January. If there's people listening to this and they're like, yes, I want to be part of that. Like, is it something that you start up fresh every January or can people hop in in September? How does that work? Well, right now we are a year long live program. Signups are happening all of December. We start in January. We go through the whole year. And then for 2023, I'm also going to make it an on-demand where people can join any time, but that probably won't be till summer, but that will be like monthly calls instead of weekly calls. It will be like, join with a friend, you guys do it together kind of situation. A lot of people also are like, I know what to do, but I don't know where to start. I'm like, I will tell you where to start. And you might not have thought of this thing over here is going to be the thing that helps you do the thing over here. Mm -hmm. Like I've been doing this for a very long time. 
And I've added to the program and taken things out because I'm like, oh, these are the, the puzzle pieces that are fitting together to lead us to the point where people are like, oh, God, this is really hard. I got to keep going. Like I work with a lot of teachers, you guys. Oh, I bet. And every one of my teachers is like, I could not do this job if I wasn't doing this program. I was like, I know. Same. Yeah. A lot of helpers in my, in my world. Oh, well, we're grateful that you are helping the helpers because I mean, that yes. is a big thing, especially both Missy and I are involved in advocacy work. And we do know that it's hard because the people that we are fighting for are are definitely in a position, we're in a position of privilege as far as safety and the comforts of our mm -hmm. lives that uh, they do not have. So it feels like this selfish luxury to be like, I'm going to back off for a while because this is too much when they're like, that's really nice that you can back off, but this is our lives. So it, right. it does feel selfish, even though you know that you can do 10 times better work if you do just like take that mental health break, take that rest break, and then come back with a with a full gas tank to be able to do better work. Right. And absolutely. Just... And somebody recently asked one of my clients to uh, take on this political stuff in addition to her teaching load. And she was about to say yes. And the asker said, I want you to take the weekend. I want you to inventory what you already are doing. And I want you to prioritize and I want you to really think about this because I don't want what's the rest of you. I actually want the best of you. So if you're not giving your best, you're actually doing disservice. So it's, yeah. it's actually better to do less better. Right. Right. Less better. What a kind uh, asker, I think, in that story. Oh like, my that gosh, yes. That doesn't typically happen. It's usually like, I need you to do this. Uh, you've got to say yes. Please say yes. And then when right. you say no, someone's like, I can't believe you're saying no. I really need you to do this. What a kind human to Right? Say, they were like, do you, have, do you have the capacity? Do you have the capacity? That's a great question to ask anybody at any time. Like, do you have the capacity to do this? Like, we are on our final day of a nine-day record breaking every single day heat wave mm -hmm. and then, i did then. almost nothing because i was like i don't have the capacity to do anything except not murder my family <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. i'm just gonna put an ice pack on my head and drive my child to school and melt the ice pack and get a different one because i was like my capacity is all used up with not freaking out about like yeah. like climate anxiety <laughs> oh yeah that's for sure right we relate. Yes. <laughs> well, welcome to our climate zone. We're sorry yeah. we've so shoved it over to California. <laughs> oh, my goodness. As you were listening out this stuff about deferred maintenance and like yeah. eat. Well, God, how did you put it? Eat like well, eat you're someone like you, you love. love yeah. Eat like you love yourself. Do this like you love. I mean, just fill in the blank like you love yourself. What a nice way to just kind of think about everything. As I've been, I've been trying to eat healthier because I've got skyrocketing cholesterol levels and stuff and everything's so complicated when you're trying to look at like, is it because it's not a calories thing. It's like what you're actually eating. And right. what I've come down to with the stuff that I eat is like, would I feed it to my dog? Like that is literally my diet of like, <laughs> would I let the dog eat this right now? And that is like, that's that's a pretty solid diet plan because, <laughs> 100%. because it's not a measure of like it's not saying you can't consume certain quantities it's just like the stuff that you are eating is it the kind of stuff that you would let a dog eat and half of it is not like my cinnamon swirl pancake i would not have fed that to my dog my cheese it's with the nutella on it i would not feed that to not the dog. dog no but oh but to me that's like to me that is almost a self-care for some reason, I grew up thinking that like you treated yourself food wise. Same. So, like, totally. Like hey, we, that's how we, you celebrate. We all, we all did. Yeah, that's how you celebrate. That's how you treat yourself. That's what you so that's self how you mourn. Like yes. everything everything is tied to food in our culture. Yes. Oh God, this could be a whole nother podcast. Also, topic. but not like let's pick up like roast a pan of vegetables and make a nice warm <laughs> grain salad. Right? No. Like I know. No, let's indulge. Let's indulge. In and there's a place for that. Sure. There's yes, a place yes. 
there's a place for indulgence. Like the other day, somebody posted a meme. One of my friends called me out and she said, self-care is frozen margaritas or frozen tequila drinks. And she was like, sorry, Tammy Hackbars. And I reposted and I said, sometimes self-care is margaritas. Mm -hmm. Like it's not an all or nothing. Just can't be margaritas every day. Yes. Right. And maybe not margaritas for breakfast. (laughs) (laughs) We're setting the bar today. Exactly. Like no, like cut wine out of breakfast. Great. You guys, we're, we're, we're on the way. And ultimately, this is what I want it to be. I'm super allergic to dairy. Uh, it's not that fucking around. Like, I want to be a wellness guru thing. Like, it gives me bronchitis and acne. Oh, wow. It's terrible. And I didn't find out till I was 40. And I, up until then, I was eating fistfuls of cheese and drinking milk by the gallon. So needless to say, I was kind of an internal wreck. So it took me about a year of truly mourning that experience, which is like, I have to rethink everything in my diet. And then one night I was sitting with a friend at dinner and I'm sitting there and we've decided we're having pizza and some sort of dairy filled dessert and I'm eating it. And apparently I'm like scratching my neck and this and that. And she's sitting across the table from me. She's like, really starting to think that dairy allergies are real thing. Yes. <laughs> like, are we going to need to go to the hospital or do you just need a Benadryl because your face <laughs> is kind of melting off right now? And I'm like, okay, I thought it was just internal. She's like, no, it's external now. And I thought, okay, the only one I'm hurting when I do this is me. Yeah. Oh my God. I was like, what does it say about myself when my choices, like the bourbon and cigarettes, that's really only hurting me. The cheeseburger. And I'm not saying you can't have bourbon and cigarettes. I'm saying that particular combination is bad for this body. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the Surgeon General would probably also agree with me on that one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, okay. So we talk about deferred maintenance. So people can sign up for that starting in December. Where is the best place for people to find you aside from that? Instagram. Instagram. I'm Tammy Hackbart at Instagram. Great. Yeah, you're so, a good grammar. Like you communicate and stay on top of it. Unlike some people. <laughs> oh, no, no negative self-talk. That's right. That's right. That's Instagram right. Like, like you love yourself or whatever. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, OK. So we we have taken much, much more of your time. Do we have yes. time to do look, listen, learns? Are we good? We can totally. do it. We can do it. I'm a... not kidding about not having to do it today. <laughs> <laughs> the next. I know. I am shocked because I have had like hour to hour all week. Like it was like booked solid. And today is like, woo, although I am, I'm sorry to say I'm still in my pajama top here, but <laughs> I've been taking advantage top. of the fact that today is the one day I didn't have to run like five kids to three different doctor's appointments across all the town. I just Absolutely. had five kids, two kids. I've got two kids. <laughs> you might Sometimes be driving extras. Like yeah, yeah. Dude, I'll take your kids to the dentist, whatever you need. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. So yeah. Okay. Let's take a minute to do our look, listen, learns then. So if anybody is, this is your first visit to the mom and dot, dot, dot podcast, the look, listen, learns are a time when we talk about what we're watching, reading, listening to, learning about that you might enjoy and be able to incorporate into your weekend. If you're all sitting there in front of the television going, what should we watch? Sometimes we have good TV ideas, book ideas, or things to do ideas. So, uh, we don't want to throw Tammy under the bus here first. So, Missy, why don't you start? Okay. I am reading this. I'm holding it up. Oh, no. I just have the dust jacket because the book is by my bed. But it is State of Terror by Hillary Clinton and mm. Louise Penny. And I've had it for a while. It finally made it to the top of the stack. And I love Louise Penny. I have read every word she's ever written. Um, I do and- not know who Louise Penny is. She writes the Inspector Gamache novels, and they're set in Quebec, and it's a he's a detective or an inspector. Oh, this wait, no. Community. Okay, yeah, I think yeah, I've yeah. talked you, about it before. You've had Look, Listen, Learns about Okay, that's why I've heard Yeah, and they're before. all set, most of them are set in this place called Three Pines, where I would like to live, <laughs> and, except for a lot of people die there, so I don't know. Yeah, don't, don't, really go don't go there. Don't go there. Although but, the real estate uh, market might be really good with all those vacant right. homes. <laughs> There's almost always a house on the market because somebody has died. <laughs> And um, 
but so Louise Penny writes those and she's fantastic. And she ended up like meeting, she met Bill and Hillary. I don't remember the whole story, so I won't try to tell it, but they're buddies. Like she's just friends with the Clintons now. And they met through her books somehow. Like yeah. I think they were reading her books and liked them. So anyway, they've written a book together and it's been out a while now, but I just got to the top of my stack and it's like a political thriller. Is oh, it fiction? It's a lot of fun. It's fiction. <laughs> Yeah, it's fiction. You well, can state see... of terror just sounds like life. So okay. well, the main character is a um is the Secretary of State. So I mean, you can see like little things cut, pulled yes. in, and it's fascinating because as I'm reading, I'm like, I wonder, like, what what if this is pulled from real life, and what is fiction? Probably a lot. Of um, it. And so it's not. It's like it's fiction, and it's not keep you up at night fiction as in like terror like it's not horrifying because i know it's fiction but it's not light because the world is going to hell in a handbasket and so it's not it's not like fun beach reading but it is an excellent book so far all uh, right I'm really enjoying it so that is my what i'm reading and then i'm listening to a book called sklars and stripes do y'all know who the sklar brothers are no uh, they're brothers who are comedians and uh I've actually gotten to see them live at a comedy festival before, and they're very funny the way they play off of each other. But in their tour, I think it was like 2017, they went on tour. And during this tour, they decided to really get to know each city where, or town where they stopped and try to just figure out what made that place special and what made it tick. And then they'd write jokes. So when they did their show that night, like they would have a joke that you would really only love if you were from that place. And so this is an audio oh, book of them talking about these places and how they got to know them and their jokes. And oh, neat. Like, so it's like a comedy tour, but a book at the same time. Um, but that's so good because that's like, that makes everyone in that town be like, these guys are the best. You have to see it. They really get it. Instead of being like, you know, that rock band that says, Thank you, Cincinnati. And they're actually in Cleveland. <laughs> they're somewhere else. Yeah. yeah. So, like, oh, that is excellent marketing. Well done. Yeah. And I think I know who you're talking about. And I think I always laugh and I'm like, oh, who are those guys? So now I have to go look up your thing. Yeah. They've yeah. been around, like, I mean, they've been around a long time. But they're very funny together, which is their whole shtick that they bounce <laughs> off of each other. But um I, I was talking about a town where my son might consider going and looking at a school and uh, I was telling my brother and he was like, oh, they talked about this in Sklars and Stripes. You have to listen. So that's how I <gasps> That's a it. great way to choose colleges. <laughs> <laughs> That'll make the right? college tour more fun and be like, oh, because, yeah, they're really picking up the, the highlights. Brother said about this place? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love that. OK, yeah. I'm going to check that yeah. out. So that's it for me. I'm going to keep it at two since we have been going forever. But Tammy, oh. what about you? What do you look listening and learning? Okay. So I'm looking yesterday. I watched Turn It Around, the history of East Bay punk scene. So if you've ever heard of the Gilman Street Project, I watched it because my stepbrother is in two of the bands that they featured. And he died a couple of years after it came out. And so I was like, oh. I'm not ready to watch it. So yesterday I was like, let's watch it. And I just saw so many people that I know. And it's like right where I grew up with all the music and the musicians. And I, I felt some things. Yeah, and it was really, it was lovely. And so if, if even if you don't have any interest in any punk rock, it's more than music. And that's the thing about Gilman is that it basically was like a little government. Like it was this super co-op. Like, no drugs, no alcohol, no violence, no sexism, no racism, no transphobia, all of this. And it was, like, started basically by teenagers. And so Green Day did their first shows there, and they're the ones that were executive producing this documentary. Super cool. Yeah. That was really great. Um, I'm also reading uh, Set Boundaries, Find Peace, A Guide to Reclaiming Your Life by Nedra Chawab. Y'all, this book will change your life. It came out in 2019, and this is the third time I'm reading it. Oh, it is wow. absolutely brilliant. And there's a workbook. Um, I'm listening to Atlas of the Heart by Brene Brown, mm. because I have to mention Brene Brown in every podcast I'm on, because she's secretly her. my best friend. Call <laughs> she me. She doesn't Brene. know it yet. She will. 
she, I totally, she does not know it yet, but I'm like, I'm closing in on you, not in a weird stalker way, but just, <laughs> um, and also, have you guys read the Lightmakers Manifesto, How to Work for Change Without Losing Your Joy? Oh, that's by, um, oh, da, ba, da, da. you by know By Karen her. Walren. Yeah, Karen Walren. Yeah. Oh, I, <laughs> so... I was like, no wonder. Oh, I want Karen to come talk to us about that so much because it's all about taking care of yourself when you're doing activism and knowing when you need to take that break so that you have the energy to do it. And uh, yeah, that book Precisely. covers it so beautifully and in such a gentle, loving way that to be forgiving of yourself if you don't have all that energy all the time. Well, and also for you to play into your strengths, like mm -hmm. Karen talks about how she grew up believing that she had to stand in front of a tank in Tiananmen Square to be considered an activist. Mm -hmm. And it's like, right. no, there's room for everyone to do their activism. Because here's the thing, your activism may be talking to other moms on the soccer sidelines yep. about a wackadoodle that is running for school board who happens to be your next door neighbor. And you're like, you don't want this bitch on our school board. She's crazy. <laughs> and you're just like, honest needed to tell someone that could be <laughs> your activism, right? Yeah. Or you could be out registering high school students to vote, or you could be giving a, like a tour of the state capitol and telling second graders how bills become a law. It doesn't have to look one way in order to change how the people around you are affected. Democracy is a participation sport and it works mm -hmm. the best when we all participate. Yes. So Karen, I think Karen did a great job with that. And then I'm learning, you guys. So I mentioned earlier, I'm an Enneagram one. I have a whole Enneagram series. I know you guys just covered your Enneagram. Hi nines, I love you. <laughs> I'm a nine wing one. <laughs> I, I, and I was like, girl, I am a one wing two. So in, in distress, I go real emo four. And when I'm not tense, which is almost never, I am, I'm fun Bobby, right? I'm, I'm a seven, uh, but there's Bobby. this other, I just started this class with Debbie Stuffield Thomas. She is my money coach. She's a money mindset coach. Ooh. And I, you guys I have money issues. I'm just letting you know. Uh, and I am taking this new course called sacred money archetypes. And so there's a quiz and you can take the quiz and you can find out about your money personality Ooh. and you can feel deeply seen by this framework. And so now basically everyone in my circle, I'm like, I'm an accumulator alchemist ruler. What are you? And I'm, <laughs> tell me. And then That we sounds can... like a Dungeons and Dragons character. Oh my God. <laughs> it's amazing. Did you it's... roll a 10 sided <laughs> die? At some point? Yeah. But you know what? And then you read the descriptions and you're like, oh my God, has somebody been following me around? Oh, it's kind of like when you find your true Enneagram number and you kind of get sweaty under your armpits. Yeah. Or as my family said, when I explained my oneness to them, my husband said, oh my God, that's never going to change. <laughs> <laughs> and my daughter said, who's been following you around when you're in a bad mood? <laughs> oh, And taking notes. I was like... I You're haven't welcome, thought guys. about reading my Enneagram description to the family. They'd be like, oh, yeah. Especially the parts where you sort of fall apart, right? Yes. Because they, they like the, the, the positive, we're all like, we're all sort of Gandhi. But it's in the <laughs> disintegration where you're like, am I going drunk Johnny Depp? Or like, who, like, who? Where am I following? Oh this? my gosh! Mm -hmm. Okay, I healthy places. Yeah, I love a good self analysis quiz. I'm gonna. Yeah, I'm me on too. It. I'm on it. All right, so sacred money archetypes with Denise D T, and you'd better come and tell me what you are, okay. so we can all hug. You know what? I'm gonna also. Yeah. My friend Cindy Whiteside, who was on the podcast, she was one of our tipsy ellipses for doing some coaching as well. But she originally was gonna start out as a financial coach because she's very into helping people look at their goals and you know the reality of their finances and all that kind of stuff. And so I think she'd be into that too. So I'm sharing that yeah. with Cindy and shout out Cindy. We'll we'll <laughs> link to that show too in the show notes. Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. I will do the world's fastest look, listen, learn for this. Uh, let's see. What have I, I have been looking at? Oh, 
I'm going to save y'all six bucks from subscribing to Discovery Plus for a month to watch Unprecedented, <laughs> which sells itself as this exclusive look into the lives and actions of Donald Trump and first family. It's supposed to be all behind the scenes. So I thought it was literally going to be like secret footage of like them watching the results come in and all this kind of stuff. It's like nothing. If you watch any basic like CNN or MSNBC, you've seen it all. Okay, it, I've heard of the show, but I'm glad to know it's no, not worth it's it. Well, and I like Rape Mary Trump's books. She's like, I have a tea kettle that is like <laughs> overflowing, spilling. <laughs> like you yeah. almost feel bad for him after reading that. No, but I thought this was going to be like full documentary style, like behind the scenes, like watching the looks on their faces start to draw, you know, all this kind of stuff. Right. It's nothing. They have maybe like a couple interviews with some of the family, but I mean, you don't believe a word they're saying and it's all high stylized. They're all like made up just sitting there at a table, like bloop, bloop, bloop. So no, it's, I think I had too high of expectations, but even if my expectations were not high, it would not have sure. achieved them. Yeah. So I, it got a 40% on Rotten Tomatoes and that is what I'm going to say and about now you that. Know why. Yeah. So, and then listening, I've been listening to the headspace meditations and sleep casts, which I always accidentally call sleepscapes, which I think is a better name but um I do too. don't you I, maybe that was taken i don't know um <laughs> but so i bought that for my son a few months back when he was having trouble sleeping and now he's a sleep pro and doesn't use it anymore but demetria who we just had on on a couple shows ago was talking about a lot about breath work and stuff yeah. so i'm trying to get more intentional or just knowledgeable about my breathing mm -hmm. and if I'm holding my breath too none much. of us know how to do it. I know. You would think. I don't know. I, I watch the dogs sometimes. I'm like, I feel like dogs know how to breathe. So I just kind of mimic Daisy oh, while she's taking a nap. Yes. <laughs> dogs know how to do everything. They're yes. like, yes. It's so I'll just time, breathe it's sleeping longer. time. It's it's laying down time. Yes. Let's play. Great. I, Let's see, wait. I've got the zoomies. Let's do it. That's it. So yeah. don't, I'm going to do the whole, I'm going to live my life. Basically just Cesar Milan it. I'm going to be like, I'm not going to eat anything I wouldn't feed to my dog. And then whenever they sleep, I'm going to sleep, <laughs> sleep when the dog sleeps. Yeah. <laughs> That's my new. I would sleep a lot. I have a geriatric <laughs> dog. I would sleep all the time. Oh, I'm for it. I'm for it. No, and I feel like our skin would look really, really good though. We would oh, be hell well rested and yes. well hydrated. I'm like, I don't know. Both my dogs dog. are like not so physical wrecks though so maybe maybe i shouldn't follow their wellness tips i don't know They're, <laughs> poor bear i was just giving him a little scratch today and he's got like this pink bloody mess under his arm i don't even know what he did i don't can he know. lick like is it a place he can lick yeah i'm sure he he does like the licky thing so like i don't let him lick a he certain a hot part spot. so now he's like licking another part so I, automatically the cone went on and he's like oh fuck so <laughs> he's like, damn it she caught me yeah so maybe that's another thing i can work into my life whenever i'm doing something wrong i'll put, put the cone, cone on, on. <laughs> <laughs> you're we up call it the cone of shame Nutella. like if you don't stop oh. that you're gonna have to wear the cone of shame exactly i want to uh. see our pictures of a uh, nutella and oh. cheeses and the cone. Oh my god! Yeah, I know. <laughs> maybe clock, it's like eleven thirty. You'll be like, Whoa. maybe that's it. When I so I can't eat things I'm not supposed to. I'll put my. Or it really... would just be a cone filled need... to here with all the snacks you tried to get in. <laughs> I need a cone <laughs> that's longer than my arm, so I can't reach it into oh god, my that's mouth. Perfect. Ah, 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 ah. Oh, you know what? I would get so good. I would be like, throw it, and then I'd catch it for I'd... sure. That yeah. cone would be like. Yeah. <laughs> well, like Bear does so good, he can get his cone perfectly over his bowl so that it's like a vacuum cleaner. Baby. Over it. Yes. Oh, he's such a mess. He's so used to having it on, though, that I put it on. He's like, yeah, whatever. It's Friday. <laughs> like, I'm not licking my armpit now. <laughs> no, he's such a mess. I gave him like 100 Benadryl. I was like, I hope this helps, dude. But OK. Oh, my learn. My learn is a shout out. Mary Catherine Backstrom, who I just love. Her new book, Crazy Joy, is officially a bestseller. It's mm -hmm. number nine on the Wall Street Journal's ranking this week. Um, and so we had MK on. Actually, it was just me. That was my only she show. Sure. It was on vacation, you. I think. Yeah, it was right before I headed to her book release for her last book that when she was in Dallas. Um, so for August 2021, we had a Tipsy Ellipses that we'll link to, which is just as scrappy as any of our shows have ever gotten because she was like lost on the way to her hotel. And when you get the two of us together, we're just goofy anyway. And so 
it's appropriate that that book was called Holy Hot Mess. <laughs> and so just saying congratulations to MK because yeah, she, she deserves all the good things and this is a really good thing. So yay. So yes, I think, oh my That's gosh, it. This, we're going to do some serious editing to get in this yeah, show down are. to under an hour, but I, it was, oh, I could just talk to you all day. So same. Yes. And we I'm, may have to have you back to dive deeper into some of these things. Yes. Oh, yeah. We'll call you. <laughs> I'm ready. Thanks for having me. I could um, talk to you all day. Bye, oh, friends. Same. Okay. Bye. We'll see you soon. Bye bye. Thank you so much for joining us for the Mom and Dot 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 podcast. We hope you enjoyed today's show. And if you know someone else who could benefit from the episode, please be sure and share it with them. And while we're begging, please subscribe and rate us wherever it is you listen to podcasts. You can find links to all the things we discussed today in our show notes or over at our website, momandpodcast.com, with the A and D spelled out. In between shows, find us over at the socials, including our private mom and community Facebook group. The links to that group and all of our socials can be found at momandpodcast.com. Thank you so much for your support. We appreciate you more than you know. Now go out there and make your ellipses count.